Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the realignment. Huge thank you and hello to everyone who is new here. And of course, could not have had a great time hosting Breaking Points with Sagar Thursday and Tuesday if it wasn't for everyone who's been watching the show from the beginning. So here's our show. We have an amazing episode of Adam Tews. He's a professor and economic historian at Columbia University. One of my favorite segments with Sagar on Tuesday was a discussion of the jobs report and how all the various ways that the Delta crisis really did run into those economic numbers. So this episode of Adam around his new book, Shut Down, How COVID Shook the World's Economy, is the perfect episode. Sagar, what do we talk about? We talk a lot. We define neoliberalism, whether the past has failed, what the future looks like, what the permanent effects on the U.S. economy, the relationship of the U.S. and China, the legitimacy of both of the two systems. There's a lot going on here. I highly recommend that you guys listen to it. Adam is a very just nuanced thinker. I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. Let's dive into the episode. Adam Tews, welcome to Realignment. A pleasure to be here. I would like to set our position in history, because what I've always appreciated about all of your books, whether it's The Wages of Destruction, The Deluge, which by the way, everyone, I do not recommend listening to on Audible. Uh, I really enjoy your work, but it, it's the, the, your, your work is the type where it really helps to also read it as well too. But <laughs> whether it's The Deluge, Crashed, and now... Um, the latest book is you're positioning economic history in a very specific moment of time. So I'd like to start us off by really focusing on the world as it looks like in August of 2021. So there's this phrase that's been going around Twitter. A senior British military official was quoted as describing the U.S. pullout as representing the end of the post-Cold War moment that began with the fall of the Berlin Wall. He then went on to compare it to the defeat at Suez in terms of how momentous a moment we're really taking here. Of mm -hmm. course, who knows whether this quote is actually accurate. The point is, I think it does a good way of setting up the time of moment we're trying to speak to here. So can you just reflect on what his thesis is positing, whether or not you agree or disagree with him? Oh, I'm quite a skeptic on that score. I have a, a big piece coming out in the New Statesman for the 9-11 anniversary that addresses precisely this issue of how one should read the Afghanistan situation. I mean, I I have to say I was really churned up by it. I'm, I'm in my early 50s and the Afghanistan invasion in the wake of 9-11 seems like it's been with me for a large part of my adult life. The mode of our withdrawal is obviously shameful in the extreme, and I've spent quite a lot of time in the newsletter and other publications trying to describe how, you know, our description of Afghanistan as a failed state-making project, you know, as an army that won't fight, just doesn't do justice to the fact that whether we like it or not, through our 20-year presence, we totally transformed a large part of Afghan society, and we are simply abandoning those people and that economy on the process of our exit to what I fear will become an absolutely, if we think the situation right now is bad, it's going to be terrible in the next couple of months because they're facing a huge humanitarian crisis and a balance of payments crisis. And what's left of urban society in Afghanistan, I think will fall prey to both Taliban repression and a sudden stop, so-called, in financial terms. In other words, they lose all external funding. And I think that will unleash, a, I fear it'll unleash an absolutely dramatic humanitarian crisis. I also fear, however, that we won't be paying any attention anymore because the West will have pulled out. Um, does this mean, you know, Gideon Rackman's phrase that there was that this is a post-American world? I see the point that one could say that this is the end of the post-Cold War moment. I just think that's a that's an overstatement of a of extraordinary scale. One of the reasons why the Americans are pulling out is that basically this is a tidying up operation. I mean, it just doesn't matter very much in the larger scheme of things. They've underestimated what a mess it'll create. And I think they've underestimated what damage it'll do reputationally, but it's entirely incidental to the posture of American strategy, which for many years now, I would date the shift going back to the really rather disastrous first visit by Obama and his team to Beijing in 2009, has been shifting absolutely concertedly towards that post-Cold War or post-post-Cold War moment. In other words, a new horizon of great power competition with China. And the big shift really starts in 
2014 with the so-called third offset movement within the American military that has now gathered pace to an extraordinary extent. And the real measure of America's posture is its defense budget. And it's now to, you know, $755 billion with huge amounts of money going on weapons of remarkable, you know, high tech status and long range. So Afghanistan in purport, and, and, and Afghanistan has simply no relation to that. You know, the idea that they're putting out Afghanistan to free resources for that's absurd because Afghanistan's a rounding error. What Biden is signaling is he doesn't give a damn about the honor of the American military. He's, he's also deliberately imposing himself on the American command chain because it's pretty clear that Milley wanted to keep, you know, a scratch force there to save face. Um, and he can he knows Biden he's got the military cornered because everyone's on board with the big anti-China shift, and so you know he's he's able to carry this through. That would be my reading. I think it's I think it's utterly overblown. As much as as you can see, I mean, I find it entirely repulsive what we're doing. But I think it's it's you cannot from that position read the stance of American posture and its power in the world. Just a quick yeah, follow up that I'm wondering oh. about here is. What was disastrous? Because we're speaking to crashed, I believe. What was disastrous about Obama's initial interaction in China in 2009? Well, they treated him with disrespect. Um, you know, they barely rolled out the red carpet. Tim Geithner, as Treasury Secretary, who after all is a sinophile and speaks Mandarin, was laughed at by um, nationalist students in one of the Beijing universities. It's quite clear, I think, that the Biden so the Obama team came back from that visit with a very jaundiced view of their relations or the possibility of some sort of a, you know, a reset, you know, the sort of policy they also tried with Russia. And it's, you know, it's in 2011 that, that Clinton, Secretary of State Clinton and her team headed by Campbell um, begin to really rethink America's posture towards China and, and uh, announce the pivot. The, the military actually kind of come a little bit behind because they are still in the full coin moment. And there's a sense, I think, within the American military that they don't want to get left behind. They, they don't want to be the people looking after counterinsurgency when the big game is clearly going to be played in East Asia. So that that's the, that's the crucial pivot point. Um, and at that point, you know, America still has rather large geo economic ambitions itself for the region, right? There's that moment in 2011 when they try and they envision the end of the surge in Afghanistan. They think when we leave, there'll be an economic disaster. So we need to put something in its place and that'll be the new Silk Road. That goes nowhere. Um, and then two years later, it's she who who rolls out one belt, one vote, which of course steers around Afghanistan because the Chinese are not out of their minds. I mean, they, you know, they head just straight down to Pakistan. Um, so I think that's the that's the the pivot moment, and, and people who know the China scene, like Kaiser Kuo, are much better than me. Also, agree that the the, the pivot is early. It's it's between two thousand and nine and two thousand and eleven that the mood shifts decisively on the American side. Yeah, yeah, I remember that actually, um, and I remember there were articles at the time talking about the disrespect, and then reading about it in the retrospective. It's interesting, all of this pegging, you know, the end of the post-Cold War era, when was it really? Was it Iraq? Was it after? Was it 09? Was it really 2021? I mean, and this goes to the heart of your book, I think COVID is where we all predicted it. We thought, and I remember thinking very distinctly, you know, it's funny here in D.C., everybody, especially press people, love to use the phrase living history. And they apply it to like every stupid bill that their like North Dakota senator happens to pass. But I remember like March 2020, I was like, oh my God. I was like, this is actual history. I was like, this, <laughs> really? is, some, I was like, this is it. Like, yeah. I don't know. I was like, I don't know what I'm in right yeah. now. But like August 1914 probably felt something yeah. like this. Yeah. What was it then? Like, so was it the end of neoliberalism? Um, was it? the end of an era? Was it the beginning, a transition? Um, there were a lot of takes flying around at the time. Yeah. Now in August, what do you make of it? And Adam, um, one quick yeah. thing, because it's very important that we, because soccer always comes up, define neoliberalism ah, yeah. before oh, you actually, yeah. because, because <laughs> what, what Sagar is getting at, and we, when we use neoliberalism, we're using it yeah. colloquially. So yeah. it basically just means the consensus moving after the 1970s. Right. We don't need, but it was just good to get your definition and then yeah. get to Sagar's question. <laughs> Well, let me answer. Let me answer the other the question first, and then we can mm -hmm. double back on the neoliberalism question, which is a can of worms. Um, I, I do think that we will look back 
I mean, the optimistic vision is in 10, 20 years time, we'll look back on 2020 and say that was a one-off. I mean, that is the most optimistic thing imaginable. If, 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 if it turns out that this was a unique shock, we will have been like luckier than we even know. I think a far more plausible interpretation is that this is the beginning of a series of moments at which what you might call the old logics of global crisis, broadly speaking, to do with modern politics in all its forms, populist, the whole works, the dynamics of global capitalism and geopolitics, those forces of crisis, which were after all building up, you know, hot and heavy in 2019 and early into 2020, get intersected by anthropocenic forces. So forces that are driven by the profoundly unbalanced relation between the about 7.8 billion of us on the planet and the natural envelope within which we function. And everything tells us, and the scientists have been telling us for 50 years now, in parallel, the epidemiologists and the climate scientists and the people, the Club of Rome folks, that like something's got to give. This cannot function like this. And this, I think, is the first moment when something broke, which then radiated across the entire system, right? It's important to realize, I think, how significant this is, because the climate model crisis is a, is a general phenomenon that produces, so far at least, we think probably regional type shocks, right? So, you know, the heat dome over India that kills 20 million people, that's Kim Stanley Robinson's fantasy, or, you know, some gigantic hurricane that sweeps in off uh, the Gulf of Mexico and literally buries, you know, New Orleans this time for real, or, you know, a mega Sandy or something that takes out Manhattan. But each one of those will be local. The thing about the pandemic is it's truly comprehensive, as we now know. It is the one thing, as Bill Gates was right to say, that could actually take out a billion people if we got one, a really one nasty thing, one. Though, so, one thing on that. But yeah, so hasn't just it the, always been that way? Hasn't it always? I mean, we had a worldwide <laughs> pandemic in 1918. Yes, right? but the but the, the the hypothesis is all about frequency. It's just like with hurricanes. Mm. We've always had hurricanes. The it's it's all about the speed and the pace and the rate at which they travel. So the there's every reason to believe, and the data seems to suggest that we are in a in a in a in a trajectory of ever greater ever greater mutation. The prospect of the 60s, the early 70s, the triumph over infectious disease, smallpox being the standout example, um, has been changed to what essentially of an arms race. How quickly can we develop the antidotes to the risks that we are going to multiply? And if you look at the track record of you know, the whole series, which have punctuated the last 20 years, SARS, swine fever, the huge bird flu, panda, you know, fear of the early 2000s, if that were actually, you know, we're only one or two mutations away from one that's really lethal. And we are rolling the dice every single day, right? So that's, I think, that's what I, I fear we will see 2020 as the first one of those. So does it mark the crisis of neoliberalism? It definitely, uh, the, the crisis of neoliberalism. Um, it definitely marks a crisis. It's not to be confused, I think, with the end. And that has quite a lot to do with how I think you define what neoliberalism is. And I think the problem with neoliberalism, some people sort of roll their eyes, shrug and go, you folks can't define it, it's meaningless. Let's use some other phrase. My sense is it's rather the reverse, that there are so many ways of defining it that the problem is it's what people call overdetermined. In other words, <laughs> it, it, there's lots of different intersecting things. The simplest way, the neatest way is to say it's a set of ideas associated with a certain set of schools of economics and you can write brilliant histories of that, you know, and you can start in Austria in the 1920s or with the Mont Pelerin Society in the 1940s or with Friedman in Chicago in the 1970s or my favorite in MIT in the 70s through the 1990s, the unspoken heroes of neoliberalism, the true, you know, brains behind modern macro and economic policy. That's one way of telling the story. And then you can say, so do they get their way? Does it remain coherent? Is economic policy following their advice or not? Then you can look at something else, which is subtly different, related to, but different, which is practices of government. How do we actually go about governing societies and economies? And this is something closer to what's called the Washington Consensus, which isn't just a set of ideas, it's a set of practices. This is sort of anthropology talk now, like things we do and ways we rationalize what we do that became increasingly general, were pushed by very powerful institutions from the 1970s onwards. And they include things like having a central bank, prioritizing inflation control, um, the idea of the public-private partnership as the high road to success in various ways, uh, absolute mobility of capital, um, 
and say the separation, it goes really into the nitty gritty here. The fact that treasuries and central banks operate s separately and independently of each other and literally have separate bank accounts, um, which wasn't true in Europe until the 1990s in most places. The French, when they joined the euro, actually had to pass a constitutional amendment that separated the treasury from the central bank because their conception of unitary republican sovereignty requires the central bank to be part of the sovereign. You can't somehow hive that off to somebody in Frankfurt. Right. So that that's a, that's a practice. A third, and, and that is much more mutant, if you like. And in fact, there's a strong theory, especially from the left, which I would cleave to, which says that neoliberalism always had two faces. One was organizing, ordering. This is the German branch of neoliberalism, so-called ordo liberalism, constitutionalizing everything, non-discretionary monetary policy, non-discretionary fiscal policy in the ultimate extreme. And another face, which was activist, bulldozing, revolutionary neoliberalism, which is the Pinochet, Thatcher, strike breaking wing or the Geithner, whatever it takes, intervene to save the banks wing, right? Which is objectively about the maintenance of what we actually care about in capitalist societies, namely the functioning and continuing of capital accumulation by profit making organizations. And rules in many situations simply won't do, which is why Keynes for me is a kind of, he's almost a neoliberal because he thought the general theory, which was a general theory of both the norm and the exception, He's both the architect of fiscal policy intervention and of Bretton Woods. So he, he figures both. There's a third definition of neoliberalism, which is even harder core, which is to say, forget the ideas, they're for the birds. The procedures of government are all very well, but you've really got to ask, as I was already beginning to do, whose interests do they serve? What neoliberalism is, is really the project of changing the balance of power in society from the 1970s onwards, by all means necessary. It's the Warren Buffett definition of neoliberalism, which is, yes, there's been class war in America. My class has been waging it and we've won, right? That's, as it were, another version of neoliberalism. So you could look at 2020 and say the ideas went out of the window. We went on to full on activism and we did. And, and the effect of that was to massively entrench the existing order of inequality in American society right. and everywhere else. So sort of, you know, it's a kind of a mixed score sheet. And there's another version of thinking about neoliberalism, very important if you look at it from the outside of America, if you look at it, say, from Latin America or Eastern Europe, which is that neoliberalism was always a fundamentally a hegemonic project of American power. It was what American power looked like when it came to you in Chile in the early 70s or Poland in the early 90s or Russia, right? And the interesting thing about that is that that turns out to be really double-edged because, um, and this goes back to our questions about China and so on, right? So all of your ducks were in a row, if and only if you could assume that globalization produced economic growth and economic growth was either geopolitically neutral or strong 1990s convergence hypothesis, Fukuyama, China, it actually handed the game to you. In other words, by growing into the global economy, places like China would ultimately see the benefits of the rule of law, democracy, we'd see a bourgeois revolution, modernization would th theory would kick in, or they'd slide into a middle income trap, get stuck, and you would end up ruling the roost anyway. The hugely destabilization we've come we've come to over that 10 year period since 2009-10 is that this is way more complicated than that. If you've got an actor like China in the system, it's systemically huge. It has proven itself a highly competent crisis fighter. That doesn't mean there aren't tensions, but it, it is managing its crises remarkably well. Um, and it is fundamentally changing the geopolitical balance. And then what happens is that you get very strange realignments in the United States. I mean, just look at what happened in 2020. You've got Republican attorney generals denouncing American business for their lack of patriotism. And all they're doing is regular business in China. And you've got people like Ray Dalio in the hedge fund business saying, you know what, this is a cold war. You can hedge your bets on. You can take two bets on two sides. You've got the American military trying to cap the flow of high tech inputs to keynotes, not peripheral stuff, not German pipeline manufacturers, but like key parts of the tech system. So that's, you know, that's a four dimensional definition of what the upheavals in this order could be. Each one, I think, is reasonably precise and can be operationalized. The complexity comes from the fact that they all overlap with each other. 
And in a sense, the meta one, the intellectual one, is the one through which folks like us tend to view this entire problem. Yeah. And that's the one which is simplest, but it's also, in a sense, to that extent, the least satisfactory way of reading this. You know, the immediate question to bring Crashed, your previous book, into this is, if we're describing this broad post-1970s era, which did more to bring it down, the after effects of the 2008 financial crisis or the COVID year? Because we started a podcast called The Realignment in 2019, so we were obviously premising a lot of our thoughts off of this idea that in 2016, Donald Trump arrives, completely throws everything off the table. You also have Bernie Sanders on the left. So there's mm -hmm. obviously going to see this populist realignment of world politics. But I think it's pretty clear by 2019, 2020, those not only Bernie losing um, and um, losing um, the primary a little earlier before COVID actually happened, but also on a deeper level, it seems as if the establishment in the US had found a way to basically reorder things. I think at the start of the book, you refer to neoliberalism being very pragmatic, um, mm -hmm. which is funny because th there's a pra there's a pragmatic approach mm -hmm. to taking Trumpian insights and applying it to the actual framework here. So my point, what I'm getting to is that it seems as if it was really 2020 rather than that 2016 post-financial crisis period that set the stage for this conversation. And I'm curious what you think about that. I mean, I, it's interesting that, that hear that history of yours. I mean, I was doing, I was having a lot of conversations like this around the world um, already in 2019. Um, the question of populism, central bank independence in the age of populism, the Green New Deal, which after all was, as it were, the substance of the Sanders agenda, um, which prefigured the shock that we had in 2020, but had, as it were, the wrong environmental crisis on its mind. Um, we're all already there. Um, and I think what 2020 did was, and I would hate to try and weigh them up against each other, as I, as I was saying earlier, to my mind, what's really remarkable about our situation, and I think will be a hallmark of going forward, is that if you thought you could analyze it either through the Anthropocene lens, we're all in this together, us against nature, you know, that kind of rally, or conversely, the kind of logic that you say that you folks were following. In other words, we're in an age of class division and inequality. Mm -hmm. Both those hypotheses were wrong. And that the thing we actually are going to have to deal with is the two massively intersecting with each other, all the way down to the extraordinary micro politics of, you know, the significance of wearing a face mask or not, um, which is the Anthropocene and the populism thing spliced together in an extraordinary combination. Or, you know, the amazing anti-Bill Gates, anti-vaccine mobilization on the right wing of European politics that we've seen repeatedly since 2020. Two elements coming directly together, right? Conspiratorial views of globalization with Bill Gates as the hate figure. He, a bona fide representative of the billionaire oligarch, global charity, COVAX type initiative, and yet in 2020, bent round by supporters of the AFD and Chiringia, you know, as as a as a libertarian anti-elite case with a with a handsome dose of anti-Semitism and all the usual works thrown in to the bargain with Soros as one of the other targets. So I think to my mind, what we've seen is it's not either or, it's both. And that's what's really going to make things very difficult. Not impossible, because as you say, what we've seen is all these weird alignments, right? The center has gobbled up the Green New Deal, lock, stock and barrel, basically, including the incorporation of a huge slice of the Sanders policy team into the Biden administration. We'll see how that shakes out in a year or two's time. It's very early days. But the fact that they're there at all is, is striking. And conversely, it proved that somebody like Trump, after all, many of us, you know, liberal centrists who've been running around like headless chickens worrying about whether or not we could still manage the world economy or we could, you know, whether the world economy would still was still safe in the hands of Washington. It turned out that, you know, there wasn't there's never been a president who'd been taken more easily to fiat money than Donald Trump. It's like totally up his mm -hmm. street, especially if he gets to put his name on the check, which is like an added bonus. So let's do new checks that I literally, you know, money I get to put my name on. Um, what could possibly be better? I mean, he only ever attacked the Fed when it wasn't doing enough in his terms. You know, even in 2019, when things were going, it was pretty hairy, the standoff between Trump and, and Powell in 2019. All of that went away when the Fed stopped acting. And because it's a Republican in the White House, the, the genuine conservatives, if you like, 
the flat earthers in the Republican uh, congressional caucus are silenced because it's their guy. Yeah. Um, so in that way, as it were, we've kind of threaded the needle. And there's a real question, I think, whether, and we saw it, I mean, that they weren't able then to do a second stimulus to actually hand him the election, but they did at least do that first one to stay off the crisis. And and I think what we what the question that America faces, and it's a question not just for America, but for the world, because America's central position is whether we can go on threading this needle. That I mean, that is, I think, the nature of the of the politics and government at this moment. It really is a very, very, you know, precarious balancing act that we're performing. Actually, we were we're gonna advance a little on the script here because I want to ask you about this. Can you talk about how the left and the right, what did COVID 2020 reveal about both sides. So you got at this with your point about Republicans and the stimulus. I mean, Sagar, you've always talked about this with um, how a lot of these theories about a new conservatism that's comfortable with no longer operating or limited government, that was really put to the test with that second stimulus. Ben Sagar, Cubis, I'd love you to jump in there with that part. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember covering it at the time. There was a lot of, you know, the CARES Act, the very first one, they were like, this has changed everything. Um, everybody voted for it. There is a new consensus. And then when the second one came around, as you rightfully point to, when their own person was up for reelection, they chose fiscal conservatism yeah. rather than winning. And then after he lost, they chose it again yeah. rather than trying to save two razor thin seats yeah. in Georgia. And yeah. I used to tell, I used to believe that it was easier for the GOP to let go of fiscal conservatism than it would be for the progressive left to let go of like woke cultural values. And I was like, thus, if the GOP can let go of an economic theory, that they could have a better electoral shot. Yeah. But that's actually what proved to me, I'm like, oh no, they believe this stuff just as much as the other people um, believe what they do. And it was shocking, you know, in order to watch it kind yeah. of collide with reality there, Adam. Yes, and, and, and you asked like a, you know, a, a question about both the left and the right. I mean, I'm of the left, obviously, and I would have to say that when it comes to the broad macroscopic issues, broadly speaking, you know, but, you know, uh, reality has has a Americans tend to say a liberal bias, um, hmm. and and I think that was spectacularly confirmed. Right um, at the very least, you could say, to put it more neutrally, that American Democrats—I mean, let's just call them Democrats—have a repertoire. They have a, they have categories. They have a history with which they can make sense of what they're doing. And however shambolic, and I describe it as a Frankenstein policy, this all is. You can put a gloss over it, right? You can gild the lily. You can make yourself feel good about what you're doing and proclaim this as an organic part of your political heritage. And the only way the Republicans can do that, as far as I can see, is by way of the national security message. That's the one yeah. area in which they're fundamentally comfortable with big government. It's totally at odds with all their other politics. There are some true libertarians, the Rand Pauls of this world, but they're unusual. And that's a huge problem for American conservatism as a governing party. Twice now, in 2008, then in the interim with the Tea Party, but then again in this crisis, a moment of existential peril for the United States. And not just for poor Americans, but for American capitalism. Yes. They have not proven capable of mobilizing the majorities necessary and then backed, you know, fundamentally destabilized. I mean, like a full on constitutional crisis. We should not, we should not move past this, right? It required the mobilization of all of the powers of American society to ensure the GOP finally came around to accepting the election result. And that's, that's staggering, and it's unusual, right? This isn't true of conservatives in Europe to the same extent, right? and and that they've impaled themselves also on climate skepticism, or rather, own that means that you know what I take to be another. I don't think it's bigger than pandemics because like, pandemics are the ones that we think could actually kill a billion hands down just full on, and pandemics cause twenty percent implosions in global GDP in a matter of weeks. There isn't, there aren't a lot of climate models that will get you there, but. But they can't. The, the GOP is also not owning the renewable energy agenda, even though it's great for a bunch of red states. Like it could be fantastic for Oklahoma and you know Missouri and Texas to be on the green. But no, they can't do that. Unlike Merkel and Boris Johnson in the UK. So, yeah, I really think there is a. Uh, 
I mean, you were talking early on about locating our historical moment, and there's no doubt that that the this crisis of American conservatism, and I think it's fair to call it that, you know, is a real systemic. It's a, it's a, it's a systemic risk, and I don't just mean that in the sense of somebody who cares about the values of the American Constitution, because I'm not terribly wedded to all of that. But in terms of like functional crisis management, it's just not obvious how safe this thing is in their hands. It's interesting, you know, when you're talking, I, I agree with you, you know, on almost all of that, which is that, you know, say what you want about the Green New Deal, but they're, they have an idea. Yeah, and yeah. like, I remember this whenever Stephen Moore was guiding um, economic policy during the height of the crisis. And he was like, oh, payroll tax cut. And I was like, I have been hearing this guy yeah. talk about payroll tax cuts <laughs> yeah. for 30 years yeah. since before I was born. <laughs> 2017, payroll tax cut. 2018, yeah. Yeah. payroll tax cut. One trick pony. Glo global <laughs> economic crisis. Yeah. Uh, payroll tax cut. Yeah. What? And I was like, I was like, I'm going to lose my mind. And there's no one but, out you know, there. Like, if you go, there's no, the business interests aren't even pushing for it. It wasn't. Yeah, I know. Was, that's the, <laughs> as you said. And actually, I recently got a letter being like, Mr. and Jetty, just so you know, your business opted for the payroll tax yeah. withholding, but you're still on the, ho on the hook for it. And I was like, oh, what a genius policy there, Mr. Yeah. Moore. Thank you so much for pushing that. But this is actually my question to you. And actually, given your background, what makes these European right-wing parties so constitutionally different in their ability to operate this way? Because, I mean, I'm also, look, I was a huge fan of Boris Johnson and like of even Theresa May. And I remember a time, Marshall, I'm sure we still cringe at this, but 2017 when Theresa May gave that big speech about reforming, concern, and I was like, man, this is, I was like, this is real stuff. I was like, what if it came over here? And it turned out, you know, that was all a pipe dream. But I'm curious, like, at the end of the day, there is a more substantive vision that the French right, that the European right, the British right, and more have been able to both have real solutions to the problems that they face and just seem capable of governing in a way that the American right is just not able to do. Well, I mean, I think um, I would query whether that's true for Britain, right? I mean, I would mm, say yeah. I would say that the Brexit, you know, I don't know whether we can say this or there, but like, you know, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is surely the only Foreign Secretary and certainly the only Prime Minister to basically say F off to business. I mean, he literally said, like, you know, the Brexiteers ran a campaign pursued a policy that is profoundly disruptive to the well understood interests of practically every tier of a, a British capital. And yeah. this is utterly out of line with the historic role of the the American uh, the British Tory party and David Edgerton my friend um great historian in London has, has wrote a fabulous Guardian essay about it um which we might recommend to your listeners actually on mm. the question of what happened to British capitalism to make this possible because something weird must have happened as it were the Tory party to just sort of float free from any kind of grounding in business interest which it has done and um and I think that struggle is kind of ongoing there as well uh, you know I do think that um, there's something similar happened in Europe around the Eurozone as well. So, I mean, for my mind, this is a this is a, a, a perennial problem. And again, I think I take it from me. I'm, I'm an obviously a card carrying centre leftist. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that reality has a, left, a liberal bias. And I actually think that around the world, conservative parties recently have struggled to come up with coherent strategies for the maintenance of capitalism. So my, you know, left wing critics will say, Adam, you know, what the hell are you talking about? Like, <laughs> but I think this is this is true, right? That I, I think the center left, as its critics on the far left will tell you all the time, is in fact the best guardian of the interests of the existing status quo in the current moment, because it has the capacity to formulate a macroscopic conception of what is needed for system stabilization. And the American GOP doesn't. The British Tory party doesn't, in my view. It's not obvious that deep conservatism in Poland does at this point either. They are on the point of almost cracking their country out of the EU. That is not in the interests of Polish society in general and its modernization. And if you look at the management of the Eurozone crisis, it's a catastrophe of um, you know, misguided, inappropriate um, fiscal policy, which has essentially reduced Europe to a slow growth 
continent, right? If you, if you, as I have one of the rather dramatic graphs in, in the book of the divergence of Europe's growth from that of the United States since 2008, and that too is down to the dysfunctions of conservatism. So that's kind of my working theory of the problem of the democracies is that, is that, um, you know, s stabilizing the coalition of the center left, such as it is the left, um, with the elite capacities for crisis management and the bargain between the entrenched status quo interests, which include Wall Street, obviously, in the US case, at least since the era of Clinton, is, as it were, it's not the first best. It's no doubt not your ideal. It's not my ideal either. But in terms of, as it were, get it, enabling us to hold the wheels on the bus of this, you know, jalopy that we're in, that is our best bet, that combination. That's where the majorities come from in, to, in both 2008 and 2020 is the relationship between people like Mnuchin or Paulson at Treasury, you know, Bernanke and, and Powell at the, at the Fed and Schumer and Pelosi. It's the same people twice over. Mm -hmm. We've managed to make it a decent long time in a conversation around COVID year without talking about China. So let's just go there. You said something that was very helpful in conceptualizing all of this in the book when you said that Xi's China dream made it out of 2020 intact. Yeah. Yet it is not clear that the same is true in the American case. So A, define what Xi's China dream is, why it came out intact, and how the American position contrasts. Yeah, so Xi's China dream is a bit of a thing, really. It was a, a, a vision that he was pushing in the, the heyday of the first phase of his administration. Um, and, it, and it almost came a cropper already in 2015, uh, when China has this mini recession that's really underrated as a historical event. Um, it's, the, it's the big financial crisis that might have been in China between 15 and 16. The Shanghai market sells off. There's real instability. The ripples go out to Wall Street. There's some fancy footwork between the People's Bank of China and the Fed when Yellen was at the Fed that uh, manages the global financial markets and holds the, wheel, the wheels on the bus at that moment. But the promise of the China dream, it's directly mirrored on the American one. It is something about middle class affluence, eternal prosperity and its progressive development. It's about national purpose as well. And it's about the sense that the government is, you know, responsible and capable of delivering this. So it's that kind of constellation of, of visions, progress at the national level, mirrored at the private level, it's material progress, and it's something about reliability and, you know, and, and this being, as it were, the horizon around which people can organize their, their prospects. It's, of course, supercharged in in Xi's case by all of the rhetoric about the century of humiliation and China's you know extraordinary resurrection from the from the crisis period of the late 19th and early 20th century um and China, it, it is not a foregone conclusion that that should have been the narrative coming out of 2020 right the the situation if you stop the clock in mid february is mm -hmm. that china has suffered by far and away the worst crisis since the beginning of the reform period a government which may be repressive and does not respect human rights and sometimes treats life very cheaply. But nevertheless, this same government makes, it turns out, a very comprehensive promise for the public health security of its population. And it won't come as any surprise to know that the Chinese population takes that extremely seriously. There are few populations in the world more concerned with medicine and health. And one of the great boasts of the communist regime is that it's ended China's status as the sick man of the world, the place where epidemics come from and where people die of preventable diseases. And they broke that promise. They did not deliver. Their reporting chain that was supposed to be bomb-proof, that was put in place after SARS, failed. And it was clearly the Communist Party that was at fault. And everyone understood that and knew it, the Communist Party as well. And to damn the, the problem, to, they had to shut down a province the size of a large European country and lock down a city of 10 million people. And again, contrary to kind of prejudice that somehow this is what authoritarian China does all the time, they never conceived of doing this. Like ever, 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 ever. This is a totally radical policy they're having to do. They've never done this before. And so they're then having to call on everybody around the entire country, 1.4 billion people. It's really, you know, 
one has to wrap one's head around this. It's like Latin America, Europe, and North America all added together, right, in terms of population. It's just immense. And you've basically inconvenienced that many people as a result of the failure of your part of your policy of your party in, in Hubei. And they get into it. And the consequence of that is that you have this self-generated, in a sense, spiraling lockdown of the Chinese economy, which inflicts a huge hit on production and employment. And most people in China don't work in large private corporations or in large state-owned corporations. They work in small, basically privately owned businesses. A lot of that is service sector work. And those people were thrown into exactly the same kind of misery that people were affected by in the United States, if not worse, because they're at much lower levels of income. It's not by coincidence that Li Keqiang, the prime minister, who's often at odds with Xi, started this conversation about the 600 million Chinese left behind at that moment, by which he means not people in absolute poverty, because famously they've abolished that, but it's just people at a low level of income. And so he started talking about, you know, bringing back the old street hawkers and having a lively nightlife scene. And that got shut down really fast by, this is the prime minister, so number two nominally to Xi. So the regime was sort of, you know, in crisis. And then we blew it. I mean, like in soccer terms, it's as though, you know, they shipped a couple of goals in the first half and then the referee blew the whistle. In the second half, the opposing team came out, ran down to its own end of the pitch and just spent 45 minutes firing goals into its, you know, balls into its own goal. You know, it just, we basically handed the Chinese a absolutely spectacular propaganda victory. And why what do you, is it- What do you mean by that? Well, in the sense that what we then subsequently suffered was a humiliating failure of governance, a humiliating shock to the welfare of tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people, if you go globally. We then proved incapable of doing what they did, which was achieve the two to three weeks stop. The epidemic has gone on. The number of deaths per capita in the United States, I haven't actually done the math recently, but is maybe two orders of magnitude greater than those of China. Even if you allow from some Chinese fudging of the numbers, it'll be more than one order of magnitude. So it'll be 20 to 30 times worse, the number of people who died per capita. Um, and then uh, America, of course, suffered probably its gravest constitutional crisis in, well, a very long time. Um, and that was intimately tied up with the management of this crisis, too. Um, and so in that respect, if you think about the precarity of tens of millions of Americans by the end of 2020, the fact that their unemployment supplement was being, uh, you know, was halted, that they were on the point of destitution, that the protection for tenants, the stay on evictions was about to expire, and Donald Trump thought he would rather go golfing. Um, that's the sense, I think, in which on the one hand in China, that vision of a competent government in charge of delivering mass material prosperity for the Chinese middle class was totally upheld. And by the end of the year, they can confidently say we've got this under control. And as we all know, the same cannot be said for the United States at the end of that year for, for, for tens of millions of our fellow citizens. It's funny. In October, we, I have a friend who is working in the government um, in, in the response. I'll try to keep it as anonymized as possible. And I used to keep joking. I'd be like, you know, they're going to concerts in Wuhan. Um, yeah. And like, yeah, but, you know, freedom. And, and I was like, yeah, yeah, it's nice. But like, they are going to concerts in Wuhan. And, yeah. and I'm they're like, going and to concerts still... and not getting sick. I mean, yeah. And I was like, and I'm in lockdown. Like... I was like, people in Beijing are going out to eat. Yeah. And I was like, and I'm, you know, of yeah. like 10% capacity. And look, it was a facetious joke, but there's something there. And so, in terms of what exactly you're talking about there, do you think that the CCP has come out of this, Xi in particular, stronger than before COVID in terms of his legitimacy amongst the Chinese population? And I know that's a very difficult thing to gauge, and maybe it doesn't even matter. Maybe in terms of his legitimacy amongst the Chinese ruling class, amongst the oligarchy, because his behavior right now, I'm curious for your view, could indicate either that he completely completely sees a path for total dominance by showing the tech oligarchs, actually, I'm 100% in charge, you guys are done, I'm controlling society, banning video games during the week, like, I am the ultimate arbiter of the Chinese way of life, that could be the insecure point of view, and then the, the you know, the, it could be that he just feels so emboldened, and with the knowledge that he can do whatever he wants with full legitimacy. Which, which side of the debate do you fall on that for him? 
I definitely come down on the self-confidence side. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, or rather, I think they're pursuing a fairly concerted strategy of risk management, and they regard tech oligarchs and the platform businesses that make them as rich as they are as a threat to the stability and legitimacy of the regime. And unlike us, in some ways, um, they're able to do something about it and something fairly draconian and quite quick. And it's a combination of brutal shakedown kind of tactics and intimidation. But on the other hand, really rather serious regulators. I mean, if you ever have the chance to meet Chinese financial market regulators or tech regulators, they're unsurprisingly super sophisticated modern professionals who spend a lot of time studying all the relevant global literature on this topic. And for all the same reasons that many of us in the West worry about these issues, worry about them in China. And because it's a middle income country, a high middle income, but a middle income country with a large quasi informal sector, there's even more reason to fear the damage that those kind of, you know, a total oligopoly of those kind mm -hmm. of firms could do to an economy like that. And so it's all the more important to manage it. And this is part of a pattern that we've seen. You know, they shrank their shadow banking sector in a much more radical way than we ever did. Um, and this began really in the aftermath of 2015, 2016. I think that's the turning point that that near miss financial crisis is, I think, the key turning point in their attitude towards economic risk. And um, and I, I read their their assault on the tech oligarchs as absolutely in line with that, completely consistent with it. Um, and I think it's about you know the long run stability of the regime. You know, liberals in the West say, oh, will we you know lose innovation? Isn't this the real driver of economic growth? I, I think that's probably a risk they're willing to take because it's far more it's far more important from their point of view to ensure that alternative sources of prestige don't develop alternative sources of power, cultural influence um, uh, uh, outside the outside the CCP and and very important that they show and be seen to show, you know, their absolute authority. Um, this is where I'd, I'd like to call upon your deep knowledge of the 1930s and Nazi Germany here, because mm -hmm. you're giving a very sophisticated take here, but there's a very unsophisticated doom that you often see on Twitter that reflects the direction that it seems you're going with this, with contrasting the Chinese state's ability at an ideological level to do certain things, because as you well know, there are plenty of people in the United States um, at all levels of society who are making comparatively doom-minded statements about the US in contrast to fascist Italy and Nazi Germany in the context of the Great Depression. So as we're looking at our country in a state of crisis, whether it's COVID or the Great Depression, societal disillusionment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, how should we think about ourselves in comparison to other countries? Because it seems clear that in the 1930s context, there was a high degree of a misjudgment. Mussolini's ability to make the trains rain on time, quote unquote, didn't actually mean anything on a practical level. So how should we just think about our comparisons to more authoritarian minded countries? Because it seems we have a, in the West, there's a predisposition to wish cast onto them because there are folks because, and you weren't saying this, but there really are folks who have said, man, the Chinese can just get their tech oligarchs together. And we in America just can't because of X, Y, and Z reasons. And there's something admirable about that. Well, there may or, not, may or may not be something admirable. It's just not an option open to us. And it would require, I mean, the, so for me as a as historian, um, not just a historian, I guess a historian of the left, right? It's absolutely fundamental to distinguish. Like I don't, I don't go looking. So under a liberal framing, a centrist liberal framing, right? You start from the totalitarianism theory under which then it makes sense to, as it were, align Nazism and fascism and what you might call the national socialist project of Xi Jinping's China. Right? That, that, those are, as it were, natural bedfellows because they're clearly not liberal. But, but I think that's a profoundly misguided analysis. And it goes back to our earlier conversation about the Cold War. I mean, I, I, I have gone on record to say that I don't think the Cold War ever ended. The, the mistake was simply that we imagined that because we'd won the one in Europe, we'd won the whole thing. And we never won the Cold War in Asia, ever, 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 anywhere, in any of the arenas in which we fought it, with the possible conception perhaps of Indonesia. 
And what all that's happening is, in a sense, that we're waking up to the fact that we never had. And so this is not, as it were, a regime that's just an authoritarianism that's like a fascism. It's a bona fide communist regime. That's what it is, right? Warts and all, that's what, it, that's what its heritage is. And so its capacity to do the things that it's doing with tech oligarchs aren't just that, you know, they can throw their weight around a little bit and scare people. That would be Putin. That's what Putin does to oligarchs, right? This is the, this is not even the, this is literally the party that came out of Maoism and the civil war, you know, and the great leap forward and the cultural revolution and everything that's followed. Like it's not like anything else. That's what it is. It's simply the most impressive by most metrics political project ever. Full stop ever in human history, right? This sustained effort. So yes, they have got capacities that no one else in the world has. You can't export this with the possible exception maybe of Vietnam, but that's on a much smaller scale, right? And the Vietnamese have demonstrated some pretty awesome government capacities as well. But that's the legitimate descendant of the Viet Minh who fought the Americans to a standstill with, you know, in flip flops with small bags of plastic, you know, of rice wrapped in plastic bags. Like, those are regimes with a political ideological mobilization heritage for which there is no equivalent in the West. So the idea that you some could somehow, you know, like you say, wish cast, you could somehow borrow bits of that and bolt that on somewhere else. You no, know, absolutely not. That's not available to us as a resource, as a tradition, as a legacy, as a, as a mode of organization. It goes so deep. It's so complex, the structures of administration they have there. And they're like loops within loops within loops of party discipline and ideology that the Communist Party still performs. It's like, you know, it's really like some strange occult kind of uh, uh, movement in that sense that we are really not party to. Um, I think that's the, that's the thing to focus on here, right? It's, we're not... It, we're not. This isn't a throwback. We actually have to confront the fact that this is the the dinosaurs still roam the earth, right? The theory that mm. they were extinct was the false. This isn't Jurassic Park either. We just somehow convinced ourselves that they were dead, and they're not. You know, <laughs> like, mm. and so then all of a sudden, you know, the dinosaur meets the tech oligarch, and it's some sort of weird Japanese manga film, right? <laughs> and 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 the dinosaur wins, it turns out. And then we go and say, we've got tech oligarchs too. I wish we could be a dinosaur. And it's like, we never were. We were the mammals. <laughs> you know, we're the ones that... So there's a sort of separate evolutionary tree here that we have to... We have to reckon with, and that is the weirdness of our current moment. Is the thing that we're all linked together in is is the tech world. The thing that we're all linked together in is in global capitalism. But we literally bolted a T Rex into our system, which was having a weak moment, was taking a siesta. But you know that's what we bolted in. I appreciate your ability to tie Godzilla references to a siesta reference, but here's just the immediate question because I'm really interested in your Cold War. Because oftentimes the question is, is this Cold War too? You're just saying no, there just is a Cold War. Cold War, let's just say the Cold War, especially let's just assume before Gorbachev, is defined by ideological competition. Yeah. You just have basically said that we're talking mammals and dinosaurs. Is there an ideological competition? Because I'm just going back to the end of high school, and I'm just remembering how a lot of rhetoric, especially at the start of the Obama era, was that we were in this competition with a China model that was friendlier to authoritarianism, that states in the developing world would be much more friendly and interested in actually um, taking up as a model for governance. Is that not possible then? Is there not an ideological competition aspect to this Cold War or is it just geopolitical? So so it is an ideological competition, but it, I just, I don't, I, the, the saving grace from our point of view is that like, if, you know, if we can't do what the dinosaurs doing, you know, the chances of Tanzania being able to do it are pretty damn slim too. And that's a one party state that came out of a revolutionary moment in the post-colonial period that has for a long time been associated with China. All the way back to the early 1960s, China was already building, you know, it isn't new that China's building infrastructure in East Africa, but can a country like Tanzania aspire to the kind of mobilization methods available to the Chinese? No. And they've tried for the best part, you know, the ruling party on and off has tried for the best part of 60 years. And at a period, it's led them to absolute penury. Tanzania was one of the poorest countries in the world by the 1990s, as a result, in part of its effort to try and do African socialism with a with a Maoist, with a Maoist uh, tinge. So that, I think, is the one thing we've got going for us is that, you know, their model is really difficult to export. 
Um, and we're not in the moment. In the 60s, one might have fantasized about that happening on a larger scale. Now, it's, it's entirely not. So it is an ideological conflict, but it's not ideological in the sense that these are two generalizable theories of the world that are going to spread everywhere. As I think we may have to admit is true for our version of democratic capitalism too, that, that also may not be for easy export. So this compounds this. It may not simply be sort of, you know, dinosaurs versus mammals. We may need to sort of expand our conception. You know, this is a radically multipolar world and it is going to contain, thanks to its dynamism, you know, the Saudis and the UAE and Qatar, who are very considerable regional players, right? It's going to contain the Erdogans of this world and the Putins, um, who are, again, pretty significant regional players that can fight wars and manipulate the geopolitical environment around them very substantially and are astonishingly, in the case of Turkey, robust to financial shocks. I mean, Erdogan, Putin operates from the basis of a half trillion dollars in foreign exchange reserves that come from gas and oil. Erdogan is like running on fumes. And look at the amount of sway that he's been able to exercise in the Eastern Mediterranean. It's extraordinary. But with the global financial market saying you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it. You're mm -hmm. bound to have a crisis. You can't have, you know, three central bankers in 12 months. Like That's not how this works. And yet they're able to do it. So I think we have to... You know, he can be a member of NATO and have the best, you know, Russian anti-aircraft rockets he's discovered as well. Like, you know, <laughs> you know it's amazing. And, you know, and we all have to go and negotiate with him over, over Afghan yeah, refugees because he's willing to take three million Syrians. And that really gives him strategic heft. Um, so I think we have to reckon with this sort of plurality of models. Um, and, um, and that's, as it were... It defuses, right? So we should not imagine that the world we're headed towards is a rerun of the old Cold War in the sense that was really just bipolar. Whereas the world that we're in, you know, China's preeminence is I don't think ever going to rise to the preeminence of the United States in the 1940s or 1950s. Um, so, so what we really do have to encompass, and so multipolarity cuts with them too. So we have to we have to encompass that plurality of. Of, of power actors that will have critical, it's not about GDP anymore. I think this is one of the things that's increasingly interesting as the American military have tried to uncouple military power from economic growth, which they're now concertedly trying to do with this focus on high tech. Other people are too, right? Like North Korea, you can be a starving hermit kingdom. If you've got nuclear weapons, you're in a different league. Yep. You know, if you're India and you have the Serum Institute in the biopolitics world, you're in a different league because you can do a billion doses a year of whatever AstraZeneca comes up with. That puts you in there. You're, you're the UN's major backbone for its COVAX program. So developing these kind of strategic capacities, which can be achieved through targeted investment in key areas, you know, shifts people around. It doesn't give them absolute sovereignty, take back control Boris Johnson style. But it gives you a measure of control over your environment that you didn't have before. Yeah. You know, sir, this has been such an interesting conversation. That's a really good heuristic in order to look at the global situation. We're going to have links um, to the book and some of the past ones that we mentioned in the description. Is there anything else that you want uh, to direct people towards? I will. I'll put the. I'll put David yeah. Edison's piece. If you've got a bunch of people interested sure. in these trajectories of conservatism, this piece by David on... The logics of Tory politics in Britain is really worth thinking about. Um, Sounds good. We'll put that uh, in the description as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Great yeah. conversation. Good luck with classes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>